It's just his genetics. That's why he's totally ripped. It's just his genetics. That's why he can bench press a thousand pounds. How much of it's genetics? How much of it is hard work? How much of it is diet? Let's actually look at statistics. Let's get real numbers so we can understand this. Now, we'll also find out that there's three stages that we need to look at when it comes down to genetic influence. So is someone's high level of fitness or tremendous body composition really just a result of their genetics? Well, we need to understand the three different pieces. So we'll talk about the first genetic piece, which is actually the desire to work out, the desire to train. Believe it or not, genetics influence our pure willingness, desire, inherent want to work out. So we're gonna break that down. Let's take a look. And after today's video, I put a link down below for a free sample variety pack of Element Electrolytes. So if you're working out, you're starting out a new regime, or maybe you're just dieting and you want something to sip on between meals, that's low calorie or zero calorie, 1,000 milligrams sodium, 200 milligrams potassium, 60 milligrams magnesium, really good stuff. And it really does keep you satiated. There's some cool evidence behind salt and satiety in the first place. But anyway, that is a link for a free sample variety pack with any purchase. So you get all the different flavors in a variety pack with any purchase from Drink Element. So again, that link, drinkelement.com slash Thomas. So let's look at desire. It turns out that desire to train, the desire to work out, the desire to exercise is not as much just about like our past experiences and maybe even our feelings towards it. And it might be a lot more genetic than we thought, which is kind of nice, but we also just don't want to use it as an excuse, right? So we look at a study that was published in PLOS 1. Fascinating study because it looked at twins, which are tremendous to reference and stuff like this, but lots of twins across seven different countries. But what's interesting is they found that the environment that people lived in, so these twins living in, in different environments or whatever, environment had practically no role on their willingness to exercise, their desire to train. So their, their past experiences, where they grew up, how they grew up, the situation didn't seem to have any relationship at all with that. However, genetics played a very significant role in participation. So like people that shared the same genes were much more likely to train if they had that gene. That's what's really interesting. So it's less about our feelings and our past experiences, more about do we want to train? Are we someone that has a desire to train? And honestly, consistency is so key that I almost argue that this is the most important genetic, right? Here's what's even more wild though. The genetic contribution to the desire to train was between 48 and 71%. That shows how powerful the genetics are when it comes down to just the pure desire to train. So let's take a look at a study in the journal Behavioral Medicine that kind of helps us understand what's going on. So it looks like there's a common polymorphism where the genes are just different. And in that case, it changes the mood response that someone gets from exercise. So where some people exercise, they feel like garbage afterwards, where they feel like they beat themselves up, and some people really get a mood lift. But additionally, there's also the perceived effort. Right? So people that had this polymorphism had lower perceived effort. So exercise didn't come as hard for them. But then there was another study that had subjects go on a treadmill. Okay? So in this case, I think it was like 89 participants run on a treadmill until they just wanted to give up. Right? And they were measuring sort of their willingness to continue. In this particular case, they were looking at this thing called the methionine allele. I don't want you to get hung up on the type of polymorphism in this case. But what they found is that the people that had this particular polymorphism, or the methionine allele, they ended up, 55% of those people with that allele, ended up having the desire to push longer and harder. Only 33% of the people that didn't have the allele wanted to push it harder. Meaning, there was a clear genetic difference between those that wanted to push further and those that didn't. Now, we could get into the mechanisms as to why, but I don't think that's that important right now. It has to do with sort of the response and the baseline of their BDNF and how much exercise changes their brain versus the other. It's complicated. But I think what we take away from this particular stage is that genetics influence the most important thing out of all of this, and that's just getting your butt in there in the first place and doing it. But now let's talk about performance for a second, because we all know those people that are just natural gifted athletes. Or are they? In this case, there's a study published in the Frontiers of Physiology, and it was a spectrum analysis of 19 different studies. Now, performance is a little bit harder to measure. The reason that it's harder to measure is that when you start getting into these more elite levels, you have lots of training, you have epigenetic changes, so it's a little harder to say, hey, someone's genetically better at bench pressing, yada, yada. 
But where it's a little bit clearer is there are some polymorphisms in the endurance world. So people that are better at just going and enduring for long periods of time, there's polymorphisms that actually increase endurance. There's polymorphisms that affect what's called PPAR alpha, which is our level of fat utilization during exercise. So that gets down to a metabolic thing, which makes some sense. These are less performance genetic modification or polymorphisms, not modifications. But in that case, they're, they're less about the exercise and they're more about the substrate utilization. So that would make sense that maybe some people thrive better with fat oxidation, meaning they're better endurance athletes. So it's not necessarily that they have a malfunction, it's just they're wired that way metabolically. Now in the strength training world, there were some polymorphisms that were noted, things that would affect IGF or ACTN3. These are things that affect how big a muscle can get, how strong a muscle can be. So there's definitely a relationship there. It's just highly variable and very hard to track down. So it's not like you could say, hey, I need this genetic polymorphism. It's more so like, yes, we can see common denominators and we can see that like not everyone responds to exercise in terms of performance the same way. But when it comes down to injury susceptibility, there were two polymorphisms that were associated with decreased risk of injury. This is interesting because more research needs to be done, but this could be the difference between like an athlete that has a really long career and an athlete that has a short career, right? So when you get into that world, it's fascinating if you're a sports fan. But the bottom line is it's very hard to measure the performance side. So we're gonna kind of glaze over that part. We're gonna get more to the results portion. So how does someone respond to exercise? Because Personally, I'm decently strong. I have decent endurance, but I'm not athletic material. I get into the gym day in and day out and I'm consistent as all heck, but I get good results. So remember, performance isn't everything. It's about do you train, your desire, and how do you respond when you do train? So another interesting study, great study, published in PLOS1, looked at the response to cardio, the response to strength training, and the response to power training. It was 24 studies wide. It was a large study. Okay, and they were looking at these genetic potentials. And what they found is that the genetic contribution was tremendous. For cardio, the genetic contribution towards results from cardio was 44%. The genetic contribution to strength was 72%. And the genetic contribution to power was 10%. So power seems to be much more trainable. Cardio is right down the middle. Like, somewhat trainable, but also somewhat genetically influenced, where strength seems to be highly genetically influenced. So don't get upset if you're not getting as strong as your friend, because you might just have different genetics, but your response and how your body composition changes could be very similar. Now there was a study in mammalian genome that dug a little bit deeper into this. It was pretty interesting. They found that with VO2 max specifically, there are these things called the heritage studies, which kind of are done every once in a while, and they look at this. And the best accurate one was actually a couple decades ago when you're looking at the heritage studies. And essentially they found that like VO2 max is highly genetic. There's actually 21 different single nucleotide polymorphisms that can amount to 49% of the variation in VO2 max, meaning that someone's genetic potential can really dictate their VO2 max because you're pushing at a max, right? So it becomes a little more measurable, which makes it a little unfair because we say VO2 max is so associated with longevity, but if it's genetically influenced, uh. here's the thing though. You don't need to have a 70 VO2 max, crazy sky high athlete level to get the same fat loss and health benefit compared to someone that maybe has a 50 or even a 40. It's more about the consistency. So high VO2 max, although associated with longevity, it could just be that they're genetically associated with longevity, right? So because maybe they genetically have a higher VO2 max, maybe there's, a, maybe there's a confounder there we need to be adjusting for, that they also have a polymorphism, who knows? I'm gonna read a quote from this particular study because it helps kind of relax and de-stress some of this situation. Exercise-induced adaptations with endurance training vary by the modes of training utilized, the length of training, and the frequency and duration and intensity. What that means is that just because someone has a genetically high VO2 max, we don't know if it's just high because they also have the same genetics that would make them train harder and longer and more frequently, right? So it's like, which is it? Is it a gene that allows them to respond to VO2 max training better? Or is it a gene that just gets them there in the first place? Now the moment you're all been waiting for, body composition. How does this get impacted? Well, with this, we look at a great study published in obesity. And it took a look at the fat mass and obesity related gene. Okay, this is, I think it's called the FTO. It's like the really important obesity gene that we've kind of looked at and polymorphism, which 
only a few people really, really, really are known to have, but it still gives us a glimpse, right? Because there could be other SNPs when you look at this in the gene world that are impacting this. And it also begs the question, like how much can be influenced epigenetically? So let me get to the point. They found that people that had particular polymorphisms and people that had particular uh, gene influences, they ended up having three times less body fat loss from the same exercise intervention as people that didn't have it. Point is, is that of course genetics can play a role on how much fat we burn, especially if you have the obesity related gene. Bottom line is that it lowers the level of lipolysis. It skews things, so fat isn't burned as efficiently. Now, I don't want you to get concerned and it would be hard for you to figure out exactly if you have that gene variation. But what the most important thing that we need to take away from this is, is that unless you are someone that just doesn't respond to exercise because you are one of the very, very, very few, most of it is just highly variable. And at the end of the day, it's really a small total contribution to the variance. So when you look at the big picture, the biggest contribution to variance that we see is actually from the pure desire to train, which also seems to be the thing that you could probably gamify and train the most in today's world, right? We have ways to be able to get yourself psyched up. This also illustrates evidence that diet might be the most powerful way to influence our fat loss because there's so many widely variable things when it comes down to exercise that we just don't know yet. But with nutrition, I mean, we know the basic thermodynamics, we know the basic sort of uh, insulin model as well. And with those two things, we can really do a lot, even if exercise isn't the best, most favorite thing in the world to us. Even if we don't have that desire to exercise the way that our friends do, because maybe they are more genetically influenced to want to train. But if you can just get yourself to the gym, if you can just get yourself there, trust me, you are overriding most of the other stuff because that seems to be the biggest relationship to people not getting in shape. I'll see you tomorrow.